Angela Orlovsky lives in Baltz, Moldova, a town just a few hours outside of Kishinev, the country's capital. She's co-infected with TB and HIV, and she relies on a community health worker, one of only a handful in her town, to bring medicine to her home and check up on her. Baltz has one TB hospital with 200 beds that regularly operates above capacity and has an overflow of patients. Angela has tried in vain to get admitted to both this hospital and a TB hospital in the country's capital, but has been consistently denied, being given a variety of reasons, from there are no available beds for you, to you're too sick and cannot be saved. Indeed, TB is one of the largest killers among people with HIV, but Angela has been unable to access any kind of institutional health care. She lives with her father, who does what he can to care for her with his limited social security check. There are no hospice services for, TB, for TB patients in Moldova, and sadly, Angela died a few months after this photo was taken. For the past several years, I've worked on photojournalism projects about tuberculosis. I've visited countries on three different continents, and I've seen how TB ravages communities in unique and representative ways across the globe. There's wonderful and inspiring work going on in the fight against the disease, but there are still large obstacles that require a renewed effort and investment to overcome. I began the project by looking at, looking at how the TB epidemic manifests in South Africa's gold mining community, a largely migratory and rural population. As a counterpoint, I then reported on TB in the urban slums of Mumbai, India. Most recently, I traveled to Moldova to look at the emerging global threat that multi-drug resistant TB poses. We've heard a bit about these new strains of the disease today, and they are a threat and they should concern all of us. When I started the project, I had no specific interest in tuberculosis. For me, it was simply an underreported and awful disease that was killing people across the world. But my perspective quickly changed. The statistics are alarming, but this isn't a disease that can be simply defined by incidence or mortality rates. It's a disease that has serious social and economic consequences, and whose effects reach beyond the individual patients to, have, to burden and handicap the families, communities, and countries where it is found. The prevention and treatment of TB is a complex matrix of science, culture, and development. By spending time with patients in their homes and learning from local non-governmental organizations who are, who are working on the disease, I began to understand the different challenges that arise in every step of these treatment and prevention efforts. I began to see how TB can affect all aspects of a patient's life, turning what's a treatable disease into a life-altering event that even if cured threatens the economic stability and security of every family it touches. In India, for example, it can cost 20 cents to take public transportation to the hospital or health clinic each day for treatment. The seemingly minuscule sum is often more than a patient can afford and can result in patients skipping appointments, defaulting on their treatment, and in turn putting themselves and their families at risk. In Moldova, a lack of understanding about what TB is and how it's treated has led to certain urban myths about the efficacy of medicines and leads to patients making unsafe and dangerous choices about their treatment. For example, not trusting their doctor's instructions and foregoing potentially life-saving treatments and operations out of fear. And in some South African mining communities, a grossly inadequate healthcare system leaves patients to fend for themselves or at the mercy of sometimes poorly trained community health workers who can provide inadequate or incorrect medicines, leading to even more serious and lethal health problems down the road. I've been especially struck by the people that I've met on these trips and with the very personal tragedies that I've witnessed. These individuals and their stories form the basis of my photography work and they help to better convey the gravity, the depth, and the complexity of the TV problem as I've seen it. Ramat Shek is a daughter, a wife, and a mother. In this picture, she lies on the floor of her mother's home in Rafiq Nagar, a crowded, impoverished slum in the slums of northern Mumbai. She's weak and unable to sit up for more than a few minutes at a time. Her son, Sana, is cradled behind her by her mother, Husna, both of whom witnessed the pain, agony, and the awful toll that tuberculosis has taken. Ramat and her husband came to Mumbai to be closer to a TB treatment center so she could receive her medicine. She's supposed to go to a clinic a short 10-minute walk away every day, but she's in pain and she's bedridden, and she's often una unable to make the journey. Her husband has had trouble finding work in Mumbai, and the family will soon return to their home in the countryside so her husband can once again earn <coughs> income and provide for the family. 
Because there's no treatment center near their home and no work opportunity near their treatment center, the family is faced with an impossible decision. They can stay in Mumbai or Ramat can continue treatment and try to get healthy at the expense of having food for their family, or return home where Ramat's husband can work, earn, and provide nourishment to his wife and children at the expense of treating Ramat's tuberculosis. This disease has taken away her children's opportunity at education, it's taken away her husband's earning ability, and it's taken away her family's sense of home and security. Kumbizili Nikisimani worked in a gold mine in South Africa for 19 years. A medical exam showed that he had tuberculosis and he was re released from his job with a small severance. He was a migrant worker and returned to his rural home on the other side of the country, far removed from any substantive health care system. South African gold miners are particularly vulnerable to contracting TB because of small, poorly ventilated work conditions, high rates of HIV, and high rates of silicosis, an occupational lung disease often found in minors that increases the chances of developing TB. Kumbizili now struggles to get adequate treatment, having to walk three to four hours a day to a health clinic, or forced to get a ride and spend money that he doesn't have on gasoline that he can't afford. He's weak, his body is drained from the sickness. Still, he tries to work a small plot of land outside of his home to grow food and support his family. Every day is a struggle, and TB has infinitely compounded that struggle, again, severely limiting his family's ability to earn and feed themselves. In South Africa, every minor has a right to an autopsy upon his death, and if it's found he suffered from an occupational lung disease, like tuberculosis, he's entitled to a payment. Sadly, many minors don't live near any hospital or clinic that could adequately remove and transport their organs for autopsy. Even in death, minors like Kumbizili and their families are left to struggle on their own, trying to survive the dire consequences that TB has wrought. Tuberculosis is a disease that's woefully underreported, both in the developing world and the developed world. In many places, there's little awareness about the disease beyond the mere fact that it exists and that it can be deadly. In the United States, sometimes our awareness falls short of even those basic facts. Education about TB needs to be increased and improved in order to better treat infected patients and to better prevent the disease both here in the United States and abroad. To that end, we're presenting a free web-based education program called Epidemic to TB in the Global Community. The program brings the facts of TB, as well as personal stories like you've heard today, into schools, homes, community centers, and health clinics. The program consists of a website that uses photographs and multimedia tools to guide students through the basics of the disease and through case studies of the three mentioned countries that inform about various themes and issues relevant to TB. The goal is to create a personal connection between each student and the broader issues of tuberculosis and public health and to show how those issues can manifest abroad and in our own lives. As a companion to the education website, two curriculum units were developed by the Education Development Center, a global nonprofit with over 50 years designing and delivering educational programs. We've designed the program to take into account the time, curriculum, and budget constraints that our teachers and schools face. It's online, it's accessible, and it's free to any educator that wants to make use of it. The units can be taught in three 45-minute class sessions, and the lessons describe exactly which national academic standards and core skills the units meet. The program has been specifically designed for health and social studies classes, but it can be adapted for a wide range of subjects, including art, history, and communications. It teaches students not just about TB and the threat that it poses, but also about the importance of strong public health in general. It inspires students to take an interest in these issues and to realize that we can all be forces of change. While teaching specifically about tuberculosis, the program deals with broad themes of public health and development, and through the group activities encourages important skills like teamwork, critical thinking, creative problem solving, and leadership. And by putting the program online, it can be an effective education tool outside of the classroom as well. Its content is suitable for adult populations, and its design allows it to be used with little or no guidance, making it an ideal tool for health clinics, community centers, and any other population that's looking to learn more about TB that has a need to teach about the disease. The program's a joint project with the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, and its inclusion in their Global Gateways Education Program provides inroads to hundreds of schools nationwide. The support of the Lilly MDR TB Partnership has given us access to international health and development organizations, many of which are in countries with high TB incidence rates and are in need of more information and education about the disease. 
And I'd like to finish with one last personal story. Rush McCovley is 16, and she's had TB for four months. Her family is poor, and she lives with her extended family in a small apartment in Mumbai, India. She sleeps on the floor, she rarely has strength to get up, and she's often left alone while her, the rest of her family is out trying to earn a living. She doesn't go to school, and she doesn't socialize with her friends. There are excellent standards and tools in place that can fight against tuberculosis and protect patients like Reshma and the other people shown in these photographs. But having witnessed the obstacles firsthand, I think that we can do better. We can do better with what we have, and we can do more to come up with new tools to fight TB. There are countless organizations that have the ability and the desire to work day and night to do just that, and many of them are in the room today. What's perhaps most disturbing is that this isn't a question of not knowing how to combat the problem. 1.7 million people die every year, not because we don't know how to fight back, but simply because we don't have the necessary resources to do it.